the differences of men and women. And I, I, I started thinking about not wanting to start an argument or you guys walk out of here debating this, but this is absolutely true. One of the biggest things that men and women can argue about is just driving down the road and for the husband to say to his wife, where would you like to go for lunch? Are you hungry? Does anything sound good? Now, I, I know that sounds like a simple conversation, and it should be a simple conversation. But a lot of times, the wife will respond with these words. I love you, babe. I'm just... just. <laughs> I don't care. Go wherever you think. Or I, it's, I, it doesn't matter to me. Been married for 25 years. Go wherever you think literally means, what am I thinking right now? <laughs> I'm just telling the truth, babe. This is just how it goes. And you guys, does anybody else, is any man in here man enough to, to raise your hand and say, Pastor Tony, I know what you're talking about? Okay, all right. So I'm not alone in here. So here's what's going on. And it's just the way that God made us. The guy is sitting there thinking, oh, that's great because I was craving buffalo wild wings. I'm just going to throw this on. I'm craving wings. And what's on his mind is literally wings, french fries, ranch dip. You know, just, these are the things that are going through his mind. Going through her mind, she's sitting there processing. The other day when we were sitting on the couch, I mentioned to him that Panera sounds good. I know he was listening, so I know he knows that I want Panera. And they've got that new sandwich, and we've never tried the new sandwich, and I would love Panera, and I love their one thing of soup, and I, if we got the pick two, I could try both of them. That's what her mind is thinking. His mind is thinking wings, french fries, ranch dip, chips, salsa. I mean, it's just a one-track mind. And so when he says, let's go to Buffalo Wild Wings, she responds with, fine, whatever. And she, rather than coming back and just saying, Honey, to be honest, that doesn't really sound good to me because last time we ate there, it gave me heartburn and I just don't want to have heartburn. She's thinking, why aren't you reading my mind? Or why are you trying to torture me by going to some place that you know that I don't want to eat? So I'm going to give you guys, and, and I know a lot of us are not very like medical or whatever, but I, I, I have a picture of a brain scan of men and women, and I want you guys to try. I know you say we can't read brain scans, but if you guys can put that up there. So this is the difference of this brain scan between men and women. Guy's logic is, I'm hungry, let's get wings. Her logic is, he loves me so much that he's thinking about what I'm thinking about, and he knows my feelings, and he knows that I love the pick too, and he knows we haven't been there in a while, and he knows that I love that sandwich, and I haven't had that sandwich, and last time we were there, it wasn't there, and they were out of it, so he said we would come back another time, and this is another time because we're out, and he asked me what I wanted, and he knows me. That's the difference. We get so frustrated with this, and let me just be honest. God made that. God made us that way. So as much as guys are like, why can't it be just simple? And the girls are like, why doesn't he think of my feelings and emotions? We struggle with this because God made us so different. And God made us different on purpose. God had intentionality to him doing this. God, God is a God of variety. And God brings different things together and makes a beautiful thing. Like we gave the illustration of, of, of following a recipe. Of how you can take random things and bring them together. And individually they're not great, but together they make a cake. And God does that in marriage. God brings these things together. It's the same thing if, uh, if you were to go into the store. And, and I, I think when, when Jen says, I'm going to run up to Target, I know that's two hours. That's a, that's a baseline of two hours right there. And I'll even ask, what are you going to get? I only need this and this. And I'm thinking, okay, that should be 10 minutes running in and out of the store. But here's what happens with women. Going back to that illustration. For women, they go in and they see an end cap and, oh, this is on sale. And I don't need this now, but I could get this later. And I do have that one recipe. Oh, and the kids' birthdays are coming up. I should look for that. That way I have an idea. I need a card for so-and-so. And they're all over the place. I'm not joking when I say this. I've literally been in the parking lot of a store like Target. And I tell Jenny, I say, go ahead and time me. I think I can be in and out in two minutes. And I take it as a manly challenge to get in and out of that store in two minutes. Say, why is that? God made me that way. I think differently. 
And it's a good thing that I think differently because there's certain tasks and responsibilities in my life that I need to do that I need to be more like that than that. And it's not saying that women overthink and that men are dumb. Well, maybe sometimes, but anyways, that's not my point. But the, the, the fact that God made us differently on purpose to be able to do this. So when we get into our passage and we're talking about the two ingredients, the, two, the one that we got into, that men need respect. The Bible says in Ephesians 5.22, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husband as to the Lord. He's talking about submitting to the role that God has given him. He's got to be out front. He's got to lead. He needs your backing. He needs the, that affirmation. He needs that intimacy from you. God made him that way. But then when we get into the wife, the Bible says this, Husband, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and he gave himself for it. God's ingredients for a good marriage is that she needs love. She needs it. Now, knowing you're thinking, women need respect and men need love. Those, are, those go both ways, and I totally agree with it. If you go back to Titus, when I was talking to the beginning of this, and it talked about how the older ought to teach the younger, and it says in that passage to love their husbands. Teach them to love their husbands. The reason why I'm bringing that up is the Bible teaches us that women are to love their husbands. It's not a matter of women saying, I don't have to love him because the Bible doesn't say that. No, the Bible does say that. But I'm talking about the primary things that that, that we need uh, of the husband and wife are different. So when we get into this, the husbands are commanded by God to love their wives. Because your wife needs, a primary need in her life is to feel loved and to be loved. Perfect illustration of this is our example. Remember when I was talking about that Christ is over the church, which is us, and over the man. And then God put the husband to lead his wife, and for the wife and the husband to lead their kids. And then there's this order. We read the order to that. Well, guess where we start? We love God. The Bible says this, that we love God because he first loved us. Where, where do we get this idea of being able to love our spouses or what they need? It's because for us as, gods, or, or us as guys, we, we have that craving from God to be loved. And that's why in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Man, our relationship, our foundational relationship with everything started with God and it started with love. So what we're in essence, essence of what we're doing is we're taking the love that God gave us And we're passing it down to our spouse. God created us to do it this way. And I know where we're thinking. Guys are thinking, I I do love my wife. And every guy thinks that. Can Can I tell you guys that there's a difference thing between just saying the words, I love you texting the words, I love you and, 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 and demonstrating it. And I know that we're good at demonstrating it. Every Valentine's Day, we go out of our way to demonstrate it. February 14th, about five or six o'clock on your way home, you run into Walmart. You get in a giant line to fight for a card. It's like it's going to be overpriced and it has nothing to do with your relationship with your wife, but it's all that was left. You buy a box of candy that tastes like wax, but it's in the shape of a heart. So you think it's going to connect to her heart. You buy a teddy bear that says, I love you or something dumb on it. You buy her a thing of flowers as you're running out the door. And then you get into the car and you're trying to peel the $9.99 sticker off the flowers so you don't look cheap. Guys, you know what I'm talking about. And the funny thing is, we do all those gestures to try to make an emphasis of I'm showing you that I'm loving you. I'm showing you that I'm making an effort. And guys, don't get me wrong. It is a great gesture. But God's love that he's talking about goes so much deeper than a teddy bear. Go so much deeper. And guys, by, let me give you some advice. February 14th is the same date every single year. Right. You could actually plan ahead and do something nice, but that's another message for another time. <laughs> so we learn to pass it down and what to do because the Bible says, husband, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. He made it so easy for us. He put it on our level so that we would understand it. I, I love the visual that God gave us. He literally just, in Adam and Eve, we, before Eve came into the picture, we talked about this last week, is like, come on, Adam, let me show you. And, and he continues to do that is through, through Jesus Christ. So we have Jesus Christ to follow, so we know exactly what to do because we just follow him. And I know some of you are thinking, Pastor Tony, 
you're going to talk about loving my wife and, and getting deep into that relationship and understanding what that means, and that's not me. And I'm going to tell you, you are absolutely right. It's not you at all. I'll, I'll bring it even deeper than that. Men, you don't have what it takes to love your wife the way that she deserves to be loved. And I know you're thinking, well, this isn't helping at all, Pastor Tony. <laughs> When you got saved, something happened to you. You had the Spirit of God that came to live inside of you. And the Bible says as a result of the Spirit of God living inside of you, the Bible literally comes out in, in, in Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the Spirit, the evidence of the Spirit of God is, what's the first thing? It's love. It's love. And by the way, that is not the superficial teddy bear, I love you, you're a cutie pie love. This is a much deeper, much passionate, much, much uh, more fulfilling love than that. It's the agape love that comes from God. So when the Bible is talking about a husband, love your wives and as the Christ so loved the church in Ephesians 5.25, that word is the agape love. It's more than a feeling. It's more than words. Jesus didn't have a feeling about us because he was upset that we were going to die and go to hell. He did something about it. Jesus didn't write a letter and just say, I love you. He did something about it. It goes much deeper than that. And I'm not saying that feelings are bad. Man, we, 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 a lot of our relationships start off by the butterflies in our stomach as we meet somebody and we write, we write the text or the note or whatever we flirt. I'm not saying those things are bad. But if you go by flirty love into your relationship, it will fail. If it's all superficial, if it is all based on them being cute and her being hot and the fact that you get along or you connect and you click together and you should, and all those things are good things, but I'm saying if that's as deep as it goes, it's shallow and it doesn't last. And eventually you're going to have an argument and a disagreement and you're going to want Buffalo Wild Wings and she's going to want Panera and there's going to be divorce in your future because you can't get on the same page. And I say that being funny, but at the same time, I'm not. Because a lot of times arguments and things that happen in relationships happen out over the dumbest things possible. Yep. Arguments that split you up, it's over something so small, but Satan's good at what he does. So love is an action. Let's spell it out. Here's what your life, wife needs. We're just going by our illustration of Jesus Christ. The love them the way that Christ loved us. Number one, your wife needs conversation and connection. She needs that. So here's the thing. Even as Christ also loved the church. So let's just break that down. Out of the basic thing about Christianity, if you're going to start at the base about our relationship with God, do you know what? It comes down to two main things. You ready for it? Read your Bible and pray. Do you know what those two things are when it comes to our relationship with God? It's communication. Think about it. I need, and it's not a matter of once in a while. You think about our relationship with God once in a while, like I'm good all week and it's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and oh, I'm having a bad day. Okay, what does the Bible say? All right, that sounds good. I'm going to go. I'm good now. That's not how we're supposed to walk with God, is it? Every single day, thy word is a lamp unto my feet. Every single day, I'm walking in the words of God. I need this in my mind. I need this constant communication of this. I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I am your rock. You can cast your cares upon me, for I care for you. I am El Roy. I see you. I am El Shaddai. I supply for you. I am Adonai. I am your master. I am your king. I am your leader. I fight for you. I am the Lord of hosts. When you get into situations, I'll be there. Go into the closet. And when you prayed, pray to me. Open your hearts up to me. I am your beloved. I love you. I am there for you. You know what I'm talking about? That's my relationship with God. You know, the beauty of it is when I'm done with that, I can step back and say, God, I love you too. And God, I am struggling. And I'm afraid. And God, I've never said this to anybody before. And I, 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 I'm, I'm, maybe, maybe you're going to be mad at me for saying this, God, but I, I need to tell you what's on my heart. And I, and I begin to unload my heart on him. And it's a beautiful thing, and it's the foundation of Christianity. And then the Bible clearly says for you to love your spouse the way that Christ loved us. He said, that's your illustration of that. Communication from the very beginning of this. 
And by the way, if it doesn't make sense, we are the bride of Christ. Men struggle with this because we are so not, we, we don't communicate. Guys, we are horrible at this. Guys get together and they're like, what's up, bro? What's up, dude? I mean, we could say three words and stand around and talk about sports and watch TV and watch about the game and watch about stats, but we don't go deep into anything. But you take a group of women and they get alone and they go to a restaurant and they sit around and, I, you know, Jenny will go out with the girls or whatever and she come back like four hours later. I said, where have you been? What all did you guys do? We just sat there and talked. I'm like, about what? World peace? I mean, what did you guys talk about all that time? But see, women have this internal need to be able to verbalize how they feel. And when they get around a lot of other women, they connect to them in that deep level. And there's a danger with that when other women get to the point where they gravitate towards their friends every single time they're going through something because they cannot talk to their spouses. Because they don't connect to you in that way. So I don't understand. She'll go talk to her friend so-and-so and and they'll sit and talk forever, but she won't tell me anything. Maybe it's because you don't listen to anything. It's compound. It goes in two different directions. It builds up in this way. It's crazy because when we date, guys, when we date, we, we would be all about this. We would investigate what they like, what they're about, what, the, what their fears are. We would, we would want to be their hero and buy them those gifts. And, oh, she said she loves this and I'm going to buy this. And, oh, Jenny said that she, one time she was telling me about when we were dating, how she loved Lion King. And that we were just, uh, that was that era when that was coming out. And I found this, these stuffed animals and, and it was Simba and Lana, is it, whatever it was. And they would, they, would, uh, they would kiss when you brought them together. And I thought it was a Mac Daddy that I bought her this gift and <laughs> this most romantic thing ever and gave it to her because I listened to her. And a lot of times we're not in tune with our spouses. We struggle with this. Here's the thing. Her desire for communication does not fade or die after you are married. She feels connected to you in the most intimate way when there's communication between her heart, her feelings, and what she's going through. Think about this when it comes to our relationship with God. Just set this as our example. And I was talking about this already, about praying and reading our Bible. But think about when God says about our communication with him. One, the Bible says that we can, we, we can have open communication. She needs open communication. The Bible talks about us praying without ceasing. When, when, when can we pray to God about, about what's going on in my life? Any time. When should we be able to, or how often should we be communicating with our spouse? Any time. It should be a regular routine in our lives. It shouldn't be like, hey, can we talk? Oh, great. What's going on now? What did I do this time? And that's not the way a lot of relationships are. It, it's not an ongoing thing about talking about life and what's going on. It's a matter of if they, she wants to talk when we get home, something must be wrong. She needs undistracted communication. Jesus said, when you pray in Matthew 6, 6, when you pray, enter into the closet. When you have shut the door, pray to your father, which is in secret. Let me ask you, when you're alone with God, what can you say or not say? Say, it's God. I can talk to him about anything. It absolutely should be that way. Your wife needs open-ended communication, undistracted communication. Number three, She should be able to talk to you about anything. Jesus said that we can go in Hebrews, let us come boldly before the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy to find help, grace to help in the time of need. She should feel safe to talk to you. I've talked to women before. It's like, well, did you talk to your wife about this? Oh, man, he would freak out. He would blow a a gasket. He would be so mad. My, my, my My husband gets so mad if we talk about anything like that. If, if she messed up, or if she did something in the car or whatever, your wife should never, ever, ever, ever be afraid to talk to you about anything. Something's wrong, guy. If, if men in this church, if, if, you, if you have a relationship with your spouse and your spouse is afraid to open up to you, something is wrong. Shouldn't it be that way? They even say that we might obtain grace. What, what have we done to let down God? I mean, think about our lives and yet we can go to God about anything. It even goes so far as to say, casting your care upon him, for he cares for you. Jenny gets on to me sometimes about this because she'll talk to me about sometimes I don't need you to be pastor and try to fix this. I just need you to listen. 
And sometimes we do that with God. He said, casting your care upon him. You know what that is? It's just getting in alone with God and you just open up. You begin to share what's on your heart, what's bothering you. Just cast your care upon him. You know why? Because we know that he cares for us. We know that. It is isn't amazing in our communication with God. Sometimes you can't even put it into words what you need to say. But God still listens to it. He, he talks about when, when we don't even, our, our groanings are, are, are just blubbering because we're just so upset. This is the way it should be. So when is the last time you two just talked? Do you make an effort to talk? Do you go out of your way to connect in this way? Your wife needs conversation. She needs connection. Number two, your wife needs help. Men can say, I love my wife. She knows this, but love is an action. She needs you. She needs you to step into her life, step into her as a parent, step into her as a leader, step into her as she takes care of the house. And love is an action. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Behind the effort of him saying how much he loved us was an action. He demonstrated it. And the Bible talks about how often that God went out of his way for us to see it. Actually, the cross is a perfect illustration of this. It was, in fact, that Jesus just sent us love letters. And the Bible is a love letter from God. God did more than that. God stepped into our needs. God stepped into our hurts. Remember, Jesus is our example. The Bible says in Mark 10, 45, For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered, but to minister. And he gave himself, the Bible says. He gave himself. A lot of guys have this mindset, well, uh, I, I come home and I work all day. Can I remind you guys that she works all day too? Amen. And it might be different than the way that you work, and a lot of times it's not even different. In the world that we live in today, it's not so much that the wife is always the one that gets to stay home and take care of the kids. She's getting the kids up, and she's running to her job, and running to pick them up from practice, and then running to get things from dinner. She's running home to put it into the oven. And, 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 and by the way, sometimes us men are able to clock out of our jobs, but they never get to clock out of their jobs. It still goes on. And they feel that burden. And sometimes we're so blinded because we feel like, I did my job. You having your wife's back is your job. It is your job. Ephesians 5, 28, if we keep reading, as he says, husband, love your wife, since he doesn't leave it there, he describes this. Listen how he describes it. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth it and cherisheth it even as the Lord, the church. So he literally says, why don't you treat her the way that you wanted to be treated? So you get done at the end of the day and you say, I want to sit down. And God says, so does she. I want to not work for the rest of the evening. So does she. I need a break. So does she. I want to relax. So does she. The Bible says, well, why don't you set it up to where you love her the way that you would treat your own body? Why don't you love her and treat her the way that you would want to be treated yourself? And by the way, this is a mutual thing that happens in relationships. I I, I can't thank my wife enough for the times that I've come home that she knows that I've been working all day or she knows that I've had a stressful day. She knows that I had a long weekend. And I'll say, hey, let me help you. And she goes, stop, no. She goes, I want you to go take your shower, go ahead and get ready and and, and let's spend the evening together. But I don't want you doing anything else. You know why she makes an effort to do that? Because she's saying through her actions, I see you, I know what you've done, and I have your back. That role, it needs to go in both directions. It's got to go in both directions. Jesus could have easily said that, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm here to die for you, and that's my job. But you know instead what he did before he died on the cross? He got down on his hands and feet and washed the disciples' feet. He served them. Jobs around the house shouldn't be underneath our feet. It shouldn't be that I'm not doing that. I've worked. Or in, and some guys, women, women have to beg their husbands to do anything. They feel alone in the efforts of what they're trying to do. Jesus said when he was finished washing their feet, he said, I've given you an example that you should do as I have done. He said, I, I, I purposely did this so you would have an example of what to do. Jesus was selfless. He was humble. He displayed it. Men, if we're going to serve our wives, we should do it in a selfless way. 
Not doing it, expecting something in return. Not doing it so that we get the applause. And a lot of times, guys, we're like that. It's like, I did the dishes. And she's like, I've done it for 365 days this year. So I'm like, you want a trophy or whatever. It's like, we stand there thinking that we've done something all inspiring or something because we, we did something that she did all the time. She just needs to have that support. And I, I remind you, when, when Jesus went to the cross, he, didn't, he, he was washing the disciples' feet. He wasn't like, oh, here I go. I guess I'll go die for you. I'll wash your feet. No, he did it in an attitude of love and a submission and, the, and pouring his heart on us. Because he wanted us to experience the love of God through all of this. Your wife needs to know that you're a team. It's not just about serving. It's about setting the example before your kids. How else are your kids going to know what a husband's supposed to do? When we jump up and we all clean up the table, we all help around the house, or we all engage in chores around the house, we are teaching our kids that your mom is not the only one that has responsibilities in this home. We all do. But if somebody doesn't step up to lead, then the kids don't follow. And by the way, we're also teaching our wives or our daughters for what to look for in a husband. I don't want my daughter marrying some guy that's a lazy jerk. I do not want it. I want, her, I want to set the standard high for what she sees in the home for her to know what to look for in a spouse. And guys, by the way, when it comes to domestic support, and, and I, I've talked to women and I just asked them what's on their heart because I'm trying to get an understanding from my mind. Remember, we, we're very narrow-minded. We don't always get it. But something that my wife has shared with me and other women say, one of the biggest things that men can do to help their wives is stand behind them as they lead their kids. Stand behind them. All day long, they have to be the disciplinarians, and they have to feed them and pick the, uh, up their mess and teach them this and carry them in this place and, and, and constantly do your homework. I told you to do your homework. And then dad comes home. He wants to be the fun guy and be able to joke with them Why mom has to be the bad guy and do everything. And dad never steps up to have her back. And guys, I know this. Me and Jenny have talked about this so many times of our struggles with this because I, I'll come in and she's in there. I told you one more time, do your homework. You have to get it done and you're not going out till you do this. And I walk in the room and I'm like, what's up? You know, it's like, do you guys have a good day? You guys, everything's good? All right. And then I walk out of it and she's like, oh, like I have to walk in there and I'll tell them to do all this when we should have their back. The example that we set at the beginning of this is how Christ has examined or set the, 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 the order for this. It's Christ in the church, or Christ is the head of the man. And God established us to lead our wives, and then for the husband and wife to lead their kids. The Bible says, children, obey your parents. Do you understand that parents is plural? We should have our wife's backs as she leads our kids. And if you say, I don't know if I'm doing that, ask her. Ask her. I'm telling you guys, these are all things that sometimes we just overlook in life. And it's so easy. We think that we're the Mac Daddy, that we have everything going to get happening and that there's no problems. But it's amazing how, how some of these issues are, are, are happening. And we are not even aware of these things. That your wife is crying desperately for help around the house. Your wife needs to know that she is valued. I ask you, what is your worth as a Christian? As a person. And the Bible says in Hebrew, or back in here in, in Ephesians, husband, love your wives as, even as Christ also loved the church, and he gave himself for it. What is your value? I'll make it so clear. Your value is the fact that Jesus died and gave his life for you. You want to know what you're worth? Just look at the cross. He constantly reminds us of our worth. Uh, do you know that you matter to God? And you say, of course I do. And I'm going to ask you guys this question. Does your wife know that she matters to you? Does she know that? Because I'm going to tell you guys, when you show or talk about the value of somebody, it's got to be demonstrated. It can't just be assumed. And Jesus demonstrated his love for us. Number one, she needs our attention. She needs to know that you see her. She needs to know that you care about her. She needs to know that she's noticed. We do this. And I, I keep mentioning this because it is so true. When we first started dating, man, we're all about this. We're, we're, we're all about writing the notes and trying to impress and leaving the flowers and leaving the note and planning the dates and doing all these things. And then something happens 
that when we get married and all that attention goes away. She can clean the house, she can make the dinner, she can have everything lined up over and over again, take care of your kids, which is one of the most special things in your life, and be up with them every day and put them to bed every night, and yet, yet you never ever say the words, thank you for doing this, or I notice that you do this, or it means the world to me that you do this. So in the back of their minds, it's a matter of I'm by myself, and he, doesn't, hey, he has no idea what I do all day. But you would notice it if you didn't have clean clothes in the morning. You would notice it if, if, if nothing was ever done. Attention is just taking notice of somebody. Action towards your spouse that makes them feel noticed and important to you. And let's just be honest. This is what happens. Guys, we just get lazy. Man, we pursue people like crazy when we're dating them or we find out, you know, they meet them at a party or a school or whatever. Man, those dating and those engaged days, we're all about that. And then we let it die off. But the Bible says, likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them, talking about your wives, according to knowledge. Live with them and notice them. The word knowledge literally means to be aware of them, to have feelings towards them. So what does this look like? Let, let me just make some application of this. If you see that they're having a stressful day before them, text them to let them know that you're praying for them. Spiritually, have your wife's back. I know what you said to me this morning because I heard it, and I just want you to know that I'm thinking about you. If they accomplish something, celebrate with them. Take them out for dinner. Acknowledge what they've done. Just, just value the accomplishments that they've done. If they're tired, take some time to take the load off of them. Watch the kids. Send them away. Send them to Target and Panera, okay? To do something. But make the effort to lift the load. Acknowledge it in their life. If they're working hard at something, point it out. You've done a great job at this. If they're feeling insecure about something, you should be the biggest supporter in their life to let them know that they are valued, that they are beautiful, that they matter to you, regardless of what other people say about them. They need that in their life. I can tell you that I've come home after a long day for Jenny just to have my back and be able to set things up and be able to make, make it to where she's acknowledging the fact that I've worked all day. And man, we can be so blinded to what they do on the reverse side of this. She needs attention. And that, secondly, she needs affection. Affection is by your actions, you tell them that, you have, that they have value by your actions. Affection is simply a gentle feeling of fondness or liking. It means that you have an attachment to them. You have feelings for them. It's so weird. Let me tell you guys, it is so weird how we naturally assume these things uh, when, when, like, uh, my wife knows that I love her. Can I tell you how many wives question whether or not that you still like her? What do you do to say that I like you? Because I'm telling you, the, the, the things that we used to do, I, I remember when I was, uh, when we were first married, and uh, I, I, Jenny and I, right after our honeymoon, it was summer, and we went home for an activity at uh, our church that we were going to. And I had my older cousin that they'd been married for like 20 plus years. And, and me and Jenny were walking around holding hands, and he made fun of us. And he said, hey, go ahead and do, enjoy that while it lasts, because eventually that's going to fade out. And I said, you know what? That's not a thing. Just because you're married for 20, 30 years doesn't mean that that fondness and affection should die out. Let me tell you guys, that is a choice. That is a choice. If we let it die out, it's because we let it die out. There should be flirting in the marriage. There should be date nights in the marriage. There should be surprises in the marriage. There should things be notes just to simply say, I love you or I miss you or I'm thinking about you or I'm praying for you today. In effort to go out of your way to let them know that you care about them. When's the last time you planned a date night? When's the last time you did something to surprise her? When's the, when's the last time you did something totally out of your character just to let her know that you listened to her? It should make a difference. The Bible says in Revelation 2, 5, it says, Remembering therefore whence thou art falling, and repent, and do thy first works. You know why he was saying that? When our relationship with God, we do the same thing. We stop praying like we did. We, we stop reading our Bibles like we did. We just fade off in our relationship, the serving like we did. And Jesus said, you want to rekindle your relationship with God? Go back and do what you first did. You want to save your marriage? You want to rekindle the relationship? What, if, what did you drop the ball on? What have you let uh, uh, slip out of the way when it comes to that? And let, let me describe it. Do you still kiss your wife goodbye? Do you still hug her at random? Do you still send her that text? 
write her that note, plan a date night. Do you still hold hands? Do you still compliment them? Do you do things to surprise them? Do you know what she needs? Do you know what she likes? Do you give them a gift for no reason or write that note for no reason? Guys, I'm so burdened about this because divorce seems to be just ripping through the Christian circles today. Yet I've got something that is grows and thrives and we talk about my relationship with God and it should be constantly growing and yet our reflection of our relationship with God should be our marriages. And we're struggling with this. Struggling bad. I'm not going to have people raise their hand or anything like this and, but I, you'd be shocked to know in this place right here even in Sunday morning and worship service in the church how many people would admit that we've slacked off and it's not what it once was. And it's both sides of it. Guys, I'm telling you, it's both sides of it. It's not just the husband and not just the wife. It's both of us that do this. And then Satan slips in. He begins to tell us that it's not worth fighting for. She's never going to change or he's never going to change. You're never going to have what so-and-so has. You're never going to be loved like that. You're never going to feel valued or important or anything like that. And he fights in our brains to make us give up on something that is so important. And by the way, we talk about the destination of the church and how the church is falling apart. The Bible says that the foundation be de- destroyed. What shall the righteous do? I'm not talking about the church being destroyed. Satan's after the home being destroyed because the church is built on the home. And by the way, when I'm talking about the home, I'm not just talking about the kids sitting in Sunday school and you showing up in church on Sunday morning or who's walking in the choir. I'm talking about the marriage because the home is built on the husband and wife. And yes, I pick on the guys more because out front of the husband and wife should be the man because God created the man to walk with God. And there's this effect that happens and we complain about what's happening in the world and God brings it all the way back to the heart of man. Where are you at? And what are you doing to step up to make it better and make it right? To truly love your wives as Christ so loved the church. I wanted to end the service differently. I want to just talk about keeping it fresh and, and, and just suggestions for husbands and wives. And listen to this. Number one, just do the unexpected. So where did you get that? Do you know why the world rejected Jesus Christ? Because they were not expecting him to come in that way. For him to come as a humble servant, to be born in a manger, to die on a cross. And yet Jesus shocked us with the love, completely blew our minds like, what? What kind of love is that? You know what we could do to change our marriages is just break the mold. Do the unexpected in your relationship. If you're the type of guy that never plans a date or never does anything special, do it. Go out of your way to show and demonstrate that love because Jesus did it for us. Break the rut. Take her shopping. Walk around Target with your wife. Be a living sacrifice in that way. Number two, be spontaneous. Go out of town the last minute. Do something that was unplanned. Plan lunch for the middle of the day. Meet for coffee. Go to the movies at midnight and say, we haven't done that in 20 years. Well, maybe it's time to bring some of those things back. Be spontaneous. Make an effort to improve your marriage. We're not good at this. We will complain about the problems, but what are you doing to make a difference to improve it? If you say, we're so different and I'm way over here and she's way over here. We're on opposite sides when it comes to this. I don't know what to do. Read a book. I highly recommend the book, His Needs, Her Needs. One of the number one best-selling books for Christians that talks about the love bank and the needs that God created us for this. If you say, I don't know, and I, we're, we're failing at this, learn something and make a difference. Learn something and make application to this. Number four, take care of yourself. I can't tell you how much of a problem this is in America when we just stop taking care of ourselves. And yet where our, our bodies are for, supposed to be for the other person. And I'm not s- talking about that. You have to be a supermodel for the other person. But we should make an effort to be able to engage in life, especially after our kids get married and they, we, we're empty nesters. That should be the time that we're engaged to do things that we weren't able to do 
before, and yet our health fails so much because of the world that we live in just devalues that. Your, your body is a gift from God, and we should be taking care of it. When it comes to so many health issues today, we have just stopped caring. It shouldn't be that way. Number five, grow spiritually together. Join a life group together. Get a couple's devotional. Watch, watch Fireproof. Go home and just watch Fireproof. Challenge each other. How about you fast and pray together as a family? Fast and pray as a husband and wife. Sign up to serve together in church. Plan things that are fun. Enjoy being together. Do you guys know that you say, I have the best time when I go out golfing with the guys, or she says, I have the best time when we get together with the girls and we just sit and talk. Have you ever thought that there might be common ground that God can bring you together as a husband and wife to enjoy life together? Because before there was ever kids brought into the relationship, it was just Adam and Eve. And it shouldn't be to the fact that life falls apart and we're empty nesters and, and all of a sudden we lose our identity because we lose our kids in life. And if things get off track, get help. I say this to every couple in this room. If things are not right and you say, Pastor Tony, you've, you've stirred up some, some, some things that I know are not right in my relationship, I would challenge you guys, get help. Get help. Because it's not over yet. And no matter what you're struggling with, there, there's a mighty God that shows grace in the middle of desperate situations. There's a mighty God that designed marriage and designed it to work well and to be well. You say, this isn't working. Then just get help. Get a counselor. Start talking about it. Do whatever it takes, but don't give up. Marriage is such a vital part of our lives today. Yet yeah, there's so many casualties. I hate to even talk like that, but it's true. You guys know it. And I started off this series talking about this in this way. There's so many casualties in this world and it should not be that way. Because I can establish my marriage on the rock of Jesus Christ. And when the storms come and the winds blow, I don't have to fall apart. Not because of me and not because of Jenny, but because it's built on the rock, which is Jesus Christ.